Um, hopefully you can all, all see my screen. Uh, we've got a couple of just some slides just to, um, you know, welcome you all and just give you a bit of an update on, on what we're planning to, to talk about this evening. A um, bit of an introduction around all the different speakers that we've got. Um, so let's um, let's move on. And so I suppose thank you um, all for, for taking an hour and a half, two hours out of your your diary for um, for the user group this evening. Um, we've got a really good show um, of hands. You know, there's 44 currently in the meeting. I think there's about 70 or so on the the meetup registration and and to be fair normally we only attract you know, about 20 25 people so it's really good um, but i think that that's due to the the speakers that we've got you know we've got a really good lineup tonight um so al um i don't know if you want to give yourself a bit of an introduction um yeah I've, you know. uh, I'll, I've got a slide I'll, I'll i'll give myself a quick introduction in the slides uh, you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So in the in my deck, I've got a quick a quick slide. Um, <coughs> okay, mate. We'll we'll leave it to uh to that then. But you're going to cover off um security for Teams and three six five using entitlements, which um yep I'm really interested in because um it's not something that I've uh, looked at before. So I'm you know I'm dead keen to to understand that more. Um, and then we've got Josh. Josh, you're you're calling in from the um the states. So thank you so, very much. I, I'm, a, I'm actually in Canada. <clears throat> oh, in? oh, sorry. <laughs> pretty, pretty close, but... <laughs> oh, sorry. What an insult. Sorry. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Like, in Canada is an insult if you like, but I love Canada. So yeah. And yeah, so I work at an energy company in Canada, and uh, I will be talking about uh, error handling and how to handle errors in Power Automate. Yeah, that'd be brilliant. And there's there's a couple of um, guys and girls from from my my work actually on the call that I've, I've noticed, and I think you know they're going to be really interested in in some of that. And then um, then Alex, Alex and his bottle of wine that he's got to wait until the end to drink. <laughs> um, I might put a cover over it for now because it's teasing me a bit. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Alex Franklin. I'm a senior consultant with Cielo Costa. I'm um, going to be talking through. It's uh, a bit more of a straightforward one, I think, about the. The which platform when just uh, my my trials and tribulations over the last couple of years when it comes to which platform to use and the issues you face with limitations and licensing along the way. Yeah, that's really good. I think it's quite a hot topic at the moment because I don't know if you'll cover it, but you know the whole power automate licensing question and the 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 logic app licensing question. Sometimes it's it's easier and quicker and cheaper to use you know logic apps or as your functions that. So um, yeah, that'll be a really good um, topic to to cover off. Um, okay, so just moving on before we start with the sessions, then just to give you an update on some of the the upcoming events. Uh, so we've got a Dynamics focused user group in February. Um, Nathan's running the Azure one on uh, the second of March, and then we sort of repeat our our free for cloud approach where we'll do again another modern workplace and power platform in April, uh, Dynamics in May and then move into Azure in June. Um, to obviously help us to uh, when we when we meet again in person, um, we've got Simon Bath uh, from from Mexa Solutions, um, who is one of our sponsors for the user group. Uh, Simon, I don't know if you want to say a few words. Yeah, hey folks, good evening. Yeah, just a very quick word for myself because I know that you're not here for me this evening specifically, but um, very quick overview. I've been recruiting in the SharePoint space now, Office 365, for the last good 10 years or so, mostly with Microsoft partners. Um, Mexa was set up about six years ago as a small boutique Microsoft focused talent business. Um, I do genuinely really enjoy these community events. I used to go to the SharePoint UK user group when it was hosted back at Southampton Uni many years ago. Um, although I think looking back, I'm sure it was the free SharePoint that was available afterwards that I enjoyed the most. Um, so when Aaron and the organisers approached me to get involved with this South Coast user group, naturally I was delighted and very much well up for. So yeah, I'm looking forward to tonight's session and the others that are coming up over the next few months. But of course, guys and girls, if you ever need me in the future, then my details are available on LinkedIn. Thanks, Aaron. 
Uh, and, and thank you very much. Uh, yeah, for everything that you do for the for the user group. I know that um, some of the attendees today are are, um, are well known to yourself, Simon. So um, yeah, very much appreciated. Um, so that's enough from me, really. I think what we'll do is um, hand over to um, Al to to kick off the the event tonight uh, with your 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 session. Excellent. Thank you very much, Aaron. Brilliant. So, I'll, uh, share, share a screen, and hopefully you can see a screen. Oh, cool. all right. So, just a quick word about me. Um, so, I'm. Oh, what's that? Go on. Oh. Uh, so, my name's Alan Erdley. Um I work um, as the head of modern workplace for a consultancy, CPS. Um, so, I do quite a lot with clients around security compliance. Power Platform, all sorts of different things. Um, I'm an MVP in Office Apps and Services. I'm also the, the hat of Grey Hat Beard, and I help run the, the London Power Platform user group as well. So what am I going to cover? Well, I'm going to cover a problem, a problem that I think most of us will be quite familiar with. Obviously a solution. It'd be rubbish if I didn't show you a solution to the problem. Uh, I'm going to go through a lot of demos as well. So most of this will be demos and then I'm just going to recap on the benefits. So the problem, the problem I'm going to cover is I guess, you know, what happens with users when they start in a new organization? The first question that they're always going to ask is, well, where can I find stuff? You know, what teams should I have access to? What SharePoint sites should I have access to? Who do I ask for these permissions? Um, usually, those permissions might need approval. Most organizations don't really have an approval process for those permissions. So it's usually a matter of, well, I'm going to go to IT. I'm a new starter. Can you give me some permissions to stuff I need? Now, that's great if you're a new starter, but actually the more common thing is other than being a new starter, what happens when users are actually moving, when they're joining, when they're moving, when they're leaving? when they maybe join a project. So maybe it's a temporary um, assignment that they have. You know, we assemble a project team. We need them for a while and then we don't need that team anymore. So we, we disband it because the project's completed. We might have external users coming in for that as well. So we might need to actually manage, you know, are those users needed to have their access all the time? Or maybe it's a it's a temporary allocation so just when you put a project team together, all of those users that need to come together, they all need to know that actually these are all the resources they need for that particular project. And then obviously with permanent employees, you know, when you change jobs, what happens to the permissions that you've had? I'm sure you've all been in situations where, you know, you move jobs, so therefore you actually you go to that new role, you get assigned a new set of permissions, but then somebody from the previous team that you worked in comes and goes, can you just do this for me? Because you seem to still have permissions. You know, it's really common. And most organizations, they don't really look to manage these permissions particularly effectively. So when an organization is, is trying to manage these permissions for a particular user, the big question is, who knows what permissions you need? So, you know, it's who do I go to? Do I go to my manager? Does my manager know all the permissions that I need in a role? Um, if I'm working on multiple projects, then does my manager know which projects I'm working on and which permissions I need to work on that particular project? Maybe it's just the project manager who's managing um, those, so that project. They know what you need. They also know who needs those um, those permissions. So they know when people should have those permissions revoked. They don't always go back to IT and say, actually, can you just remove the permissions from Fred over there because he's no longer on the project? And can you add them to Jane over there because she's come onto the project? Usually it's easier just to have an open permission model where actually it doesn't matter who has access. And that might be a viable, a viable option. But in most cases, those permissions will be assigned and then they are forgotten. They're never going to be revoked. They're never going to be reviewed. Six years after changing role, if you're still in the organization, you may still find that you have access to the things that you had on day one, even though your role may have changed and you may no longer need um, access to those, those areas. 
So understanding who actually manages those permissions is really important. What permissions does any single employee need at a given time based on their job role and what they're working on? It's actually really important. Obviously, internally, that's one thing. But now that we're starting to collaborate with external parties more often, it gets a bit more complicated. I mean, I'm sure everybody who uses Teams, you might have permissions to more than one environment if you're working in a consultancy and working on projects where you have partner organisations. You then have permissions that are allocated to you as a guest user in that particular environment. Now, if I'm running a project and I invite people <coughs> in and I give them access to a team in my tenant, um, how do I know that they actually still need those permissions? You know, maybe I'm not the one who's actually managing who in that partner organization is is working for my project. So one of the things that we need to manage is how we we revoke those permissions, we review those permissions, um, and we basically we make sure those external users only have the permissions they need at the time when they need them. So there's some common problems. I think probably most people are familiar with these sorts of problems. Um, but there is also a solution, which is great. Um, so the solution is called entitlements. So it's part of um, Azure AD. And essentially what entitlements does is it allows us to create a catalog of resources. Um, and then within that catalog, we can assign permissions to people so they can actually create what we call access packages. Those access packages consist of a set of permissions um, and they're managed as a unit, a unit of permissions. So we can actually publish them so that users can actually request them. We can have an approval process in them. So, you know, we can actually have somebody approve the request. And we can actually put multiple layers in there as well. So we could have, for example, the line manager and then the project manager approving access to a set of project permissions. But we then have reviewing access as well. So we've got access reviews built into this and then we have automatic revoking the access at the end. So we have a full life cycle um, that we can actually manage and we can delegate permissions. So we can actually delegate it out of IT and we can even delegate it outside of the organization to guest organizations, external organizations. So it gives us a really powerful way to pull together multiple sets of, of permissions and actually package them up and allow self-service requesting of those permissions. As a user, I can actually go through and I can browse the available entitlements. So the access packages that have been published, I can browse them. And I can see what I'm permitted to request. I can then request them and then once approved, I have access. So all theoretically, and if the demo gods are uh, on my side, I'll show you this. It all works very smoothly to actually manage that whole permissions lifecycle. So. That's enough of the talking. Now I'm going to try and flip over and actually do some demos. So let's see. Uh, I've got quite a few different accounts that I actually need to, to demo here. So let me stop that. Right. So the first one that I'm going to do is the admin account. So I'm in Azure AD and I've got identity governance. Um, so I've got it pinned. And identity governance has a bunch of different things. So if you're familiar with the privileged identity management, it has that in there. Access reviews basically allow you to check um, whether people still need access to your site, but that's done on a site-by-site -site basis. But what we're really interested in is the entitlement management. So I'm going to come into catalogs first, actually, because one of the things that I said is that we can create a catalog. So in here, I have several different catalogs set up. So one of them is PMO. So this is the one that I'm going to use today. And within PMO, I have various things here. So I have resources. So I have a set of different resources. And this is made up of um, various things. So groups and teams, applications, sites. So I can manage all of those because the permissions for all of those is managed through Azure. And from those resources, I can then create access packages. 
Now, you'll see here we've got three access packages. Um, one is owner, one is member external, and one is member internal. So I'm basically packaging up different sets of permissions, and I'll step through these and show you what these, these actually look like. But this is basically giving me three different sets of permissions that I can publish to different audiences within my organization. And I can then see how many active assignments they have, how many active resources, the roles they have in there. Um, so this gives means that I can say, actually, if I have a new project manager come on board, I have an access package for them, PMO owner, and that will give them owner permissions. If I have an internal project member, I have an internal package, and that will give them specific permissions, and that will have a specific approval process for internal users. And then I have one for external users, so I can then manage how those external guests can request access and then actually um, the approval process will be different for them because they are external. And then I have roles and administrators as well, so I can actually create different roles. I can add package managers, assignment managers, so I can delegate some of this out of IT and actually the people who are functionally owning these permissions and the, the resources that are within these, we can actually get them to manage these. So it's quite a powerful tool to have the access packages in place um, with it, sorry, the catalogs within place that define all the assets, the resources that we're actually going to use. So I'm going to create a new access package in here. So essentially we're going to give this a name, uh, imaginative tech guy name, demo, and Essentially, that's the name that we're going to actually see when we when we choose this. So when we come through to the roles, what I have here is basically the resources that I want to give access to. So it's resource roles because we're actually choosing. Um, whenever we choose one of these, we're choosing either a site or a group. So in here we've got some teams. Actually, let me just. Come through to one of my other sites and I should have set this up. So apologies. Let me just set this up. So this user is Gurney and hopefully. Should see. So we should see. So we've got some sites here. Now all staff HR staff. That's the only things that we've got in here and this this one is Gurney. So what we'll see at the end is this will miraculously change if all goes according to plan. So if we just come back here. This one. So what we can do here, we've got our groups. These are the groups that are in the catalog. If I check this, I can see all groups that are in our organization. But because we're within the context of a catalog, I want to just manage these. So if I put those in here, and then what we see is this is a group, but we can actually choose the role. So do I want owner or member? So when I had the PMO owner, I can give them the owner role and I can give different different mem different roles for different groups. So these are our groups and teams. So these are the ones that we will expect to see pop up within teams for our user. I can choose applications as well. So again, I've got DevOps in here and I can add that in. And I can also add, so I can got a default access role in there. And then I can also add SharePoint sites in here. So I've got a site in here as well. And essentially we're giving different permissions. So I can say just a visitor, read only access essentially. So I can manage the permissions that I'm giving for each of these resources. When I come through to the requests, this is really saying who do we want to have access to it? So we might say none. This might be an IT role, uh, an access package for IT that we don't actually want people to do as self-service. Um, but we can say, so let's start with users in my directory. So I can actually choose specific users, all members excluding guests or all users including guests. This is who I'm publishing this to. So anybody in here, um, I can actually they can actually select this. So if I say uh, all you all members excluding guests require approval? I can say yes. Um, does it require a justification? So we'll leave that on. 
do I want two steps? So I could say manager comes up as a default, or I can choose specific approvers. Um, I can add a fallback. So if the manager doesn't respond, uh, let's add me in there. And then basically here we've got how many days. So this request will be open for 14 days. Um, we're not expecting an instantaneous response. We're expecting it within 14 days. I can reduce that down if I want, let's say two. Uh, approve a justification. Uh, if no action, forward on to alternate approvers. So I can do that as well. And I can then say alternate second, second approvers. So second level manager, for example. So it goes up another level based on the Active Directory hierarchy. So a lot of this is built in to the Active Directory hierarchy. So I should check and see whether there are any questions coming through. Um, no, OK. Cool, no hats. I might have a hat, but no hat today. Um, other things here, enable new requests and assignments. Do I want this to be on or off? So this is really setting it. It can be active or not, which basically means if I don't want anybody requesting it, they won't see it. Now, this is all for internal. So this manager as a prover is obviously an internal um, role that we can see based on Active Directory. If I say users not in my directory, then I can actually start to control who. So specific connected organizations. So within this, I can actually manage a connected organization, put their domain in, and then that will basically restrict who this gets published to. And users in that organization can then see um, what we have published here. So I can configure connected organizations, uh, or I can just say all. So that could be any, any organization or any new external users. Um, I can't do approvals if it's any, but if it's connected organizations, I can actually do approval. So I can actually say yes. I can ask for um, the justification. And here we get the first approver being an external sponsor. So that basically means if we're working with a partner organization, somebody in that partner organization can be approving that the person who's requested access is actually supposed to be working on our project and therefore have access to our tenant. So it gives us that, that ability to essentially offload that first level of approval to a, an external organization. That way, you know, our project manager might be approving and saying yes, but that that external approver has the first the first say to say yes, that's that should be allowed or not. So some really nice ways to actually manage internally our users internally um, and external users. So let's just um, click on to the next one. So I can also put custom questions in here as well. So I can say you know, um, which project, for example, if there's multiple projects, and I can choose different formats in here. So short text, multiple choice. I can put in choices. I can say project A, B. So I can add in different custom information. And these, these questions are all designed to allow our approvers to really understand should this person have access to our, our project and our teams and our resources? The next step is the life cycle. So access package assignments expire. So is it going to be available for a number of days? Maybe. Um, it might be never, and it's just going to carry on going. But it could be you know, on a particular date. So at the end of a financial year, we want to close off all of the projects, or we know this, this permission should be stopping after a number of days we can put that information in here. If I put access reviews in, so let's put never in there. Access reviews allow us to have a periodic check. Does this person still need these permissions? Yes or no? So we can start a review and we can say, actually, we're going to run it monthly and it's going to last for, say, four days. And it, that four days is going to give us a period of time for the approver to go back through and go, yes, we know that this person still needs access to these sites and resources. And we can say self-review. I never quite understood why you would do a self-review, or we can do specific reviewers. So we can say 
maybe our project manager is the person who needs to carry on reviewing these permissions to this particular project or the HR director or the HR manager if it's an HR set of resources. So with all of this set up, basically we have the ability to say, what are we going to publish? What permissions to each of those resources are we going to publish? Who can request them? What is the approval process for those requests? Um, and then what is the expiration of custom questions and what is the expiration? So how are we going to revoke those permissions at the end? So that's kind of a breakdown of what we put into this, this request process. Um, I'm going to, uh, so I'm now going to cancel all the way out of that. Um, so if I have a look at one of these, I'm going to look at the internal one. So when I come in to look at this internal one, the key thing here is that whilst we've defined this, we have this link. Now the myaccess.microsoft.com is a little known link, not used very much, only for access reviews and entitlements. So if I now come over to Gurney, um, so hopefully I'm in as the right person here. Yep, uh, so access packages, so this is request history. Um, if I want to actually look at the access packages that are available, I can see them. If I look at the PMO member, I can choose to request it and I can see questions. Which project will you be working on? Is it a temporary assignment? What's the business justification? Now, hopefully I already have a request history and one that's in pending approval. So I've actually made this request already. And if I look at this, I can see that it's been submitted. And if I come over to my next user. So in here, this is the request that I made earlier. So this is the approval process. So I'm basically coming in here. I look at the details and I can see the questions that have been asked. So I can see I need to demo entitlements. This is the demo that I'm working on. Um, and so from there, I can put a reason. Again, imaginative reason. I can click on approve. That'll say that it's actually been successfully approved. And then I'll come through here and hopefully. It's come through here and again, this is the second level of approval. I can click in here, I can see the request details, I can see when it was requested, when it's due, I can see uh, the approval history in here as well, I can see the package, uh, and I can then say approved. Approve that, again that's being approved, which is good. So then if I come back to my original requester, so in here I can see the history so I can see if it's not been approved I can see where it's up to but I can also see that it has been approved and it is now delivering so it's actually applying those permissions um, to my account so theoretically and you know, if I come in here um, all staff HR staff force it and hopefully fingers crossed if it does it fast enough it will pop up oh it will pop up. Right, I'm going to go back to the presentation, finish that off, and then we'll pop back. Oh, oh, there you go. As if by magic, I've just been added into those those permissions. So Teams is updated because those permissions have actually been allocated to my my account now. So let me come back to the presentation and just finish off. So what the demo did, I went through basically creating that access package um, and then showing how you actually browse, how you request an access package and what that approval process looks like. Um, the review access at the end um, takes a little bit longer to get to, um, but essentially it's in that same that same interface as the approvers had to see those those access reviews after a period of time. So key things here around the benefits. 
Now, with everything that's Microsoft, um, as certain people on the call know, the first thing we have to address is the licensing word. Um, so licensing for this is Azure AD Premium P2. So if you have EM and SE5, um, then you're OK. If not, then you'll need to look at an uplift to Azure AD Premium P2. There's then all sorts of numbers about if you are, how many people are licensed and how many people are guests uh, and how many people are using this. Um, but essentially, the crux of the matter is you need to uplift in terms of the licensing. You don't need the full um, EMNS E5, but certainly Azure AD Premium P2. But once you do have that in place, you know, the benefits are really, really clear for this. You can manage a catalog of permissions based on the role, um, the resources, what permissions you want to give to people. It is a self-service um, process. You can publish that externally as well. Um, so that self-service is, is for external people. And you have confidence there's a full lifecycle management there. So the permissions are revoked once they are uh, expired. You know, if it does, if they don't get renewed, then they are revoked. But you can put those access reviews in place so that you are asking on a regular basis, does this person still need these permissions? Yes or no? So it gives you confidence that actually, if at a click of a button, I can revoke the whole access package, a user will lose permissions to all of those particular resources um, within that access package. And because you can automatically revoke them, uh, it means that you're less likely to have permissions lingering where you don't want them. The external users, I mean, it's a key thing here. The more we work with, with external users, we're encouraging people to come in and be guests in our environment so that we're working on single copies of documents, that we're collaborating together. Managing some of that external approval process is really important because we're never going to necessarily know who in a partner organisation is supposed to be working on our projects within our environment. So that integration works really, really well for us. So that uh, in a is a very sort of whistle stop tour of entitlements. Um, are there any questions? I think Ben, <coughs> sorry, meeting my dinner. Um, I think <laughs> Ben's, Ben's got a comment in the questions. Um, around if you've got M365 E3, is there a, a licensing uplift to P2 or is it? The yeah, so, as no, the, so you could you can do the uplift just to Azure AD P2. So we see a lot of the clients opting for just that uplift in the Azure AD um, licensing rather than the full the full license for the full EMNS. Oh, how much? Oh, that's just a mean question to throw out, isn't it? <laughs> sounds, sounds like a test question. Yeah, speak, speak to your licensing provider. <laughs> um, no, I mean, off the top of my head, I think it's about six pounds, six pounds per user per month. Yeah, Actually, that wasn't too far off, was it? 6.708. But obviously, I mean, that, that does depend on how you how you are licensed, whether it's an EA or CSP and what offers you can get. Sounds good. And uh, Al, are you seeing a lot of customers start using this feature? Uh, we are seeing a lot of customers start using this feature. Um, we're not seeing customers necessarily using it for all, all of their users, but certainly where they have secured areas where they need to manage the, the permissions. Uh, so HR, finance, it gives a really nice sort of security layer on top of that. If you are predominantly a sort of an open organization and you don't have a need to secure those areas, um, then there isn't so much benefit. But certainly those particular functions are benefiting from it. But also um, high compliance organizations, finances, yeah, is using this a lot for um, certainly that collaboration. Um, and some organizations are just using this for the external collaboration just to be able to actually manage those those entitlements for multiple sites uh, or just using the access reviews, which also needs the same license level. Yeah, and I, I guess this is probably one of those hidden gems that unless the IT administrators or Office 365 administrators have been made aware of, it's, it's hidden under the, uh, the covers, isn't it, this sort of functionality? 
Yeah, I mean, the access reviews have been around a while. The entitlements have went GAA last autumn. Um, so they're, they're relatively new, um, but they are, yeah, it is kind of hidden under the covers. People don't really recognize recognize that it's there. They haven't shouted a lot about it. Um, Akin, in terms of your question about including file share permissions into the package for approval, uh, no, you can't do that in terms of the permissions, but what I would suggest for that is using sensitivity labels for groups and team and sites, and that way you can actually control um, whether guest users can be brought in and what file share permissions are included in those those underlying teams. This is really just giving permissions to the teams and to the sites and to the applications that are authenticated through Azure AD. Sounds good. Uh, any more questions from anyone? Uh, if if not, if you do have questions later on, then feel free to reach out on on Twitter or on LinkedIn. Um, uh, so, Philip, got one more in there. Else. This scenario, who needs an ADP two? Yes, yes. So it does need the ADP two. Yeah, who who needs it? Just the the person being given the rights. Ah, uh, it, it's uh, they've got some really good documentation on it. Um, but essentially, if I just come back to this one. So it's members who can request an access package. So if you're publishing those access packages out, uh, if it's members and guests who request an access package, um, they need it. anyone involved in the approval process as well. So as I say, if you are managing just, just for your HR department, just for your finance department, it would be those users because they are actually requesting an access package and then whoever's approving those, those access packages. In term, ben, in terms of everyone, if you have a high compliance organization where all sites or a lot of sites are locked down, then yes, you can think of it as as everyone um, if they're all going to need access, an access package published to them. But most organizations we see are starting a bit smaller than that. Uh, all right. Um, yeah, I don't think there's any more questions there. Um, so thank you very much, Al, for that. It's really good. Um, it's an area that personally I've heard of, but not really looked into it too much because um, yeah, it sort of doesn't come into my world too much. But yeah, that's really good functionality. Yeah, it's nice the way it works automatically in the background. So yeah, as I say, if you've got any other questions, um, feel free to drop them in the chat or, or reach out on Twitter or LinkedIn. Fabulous. Excellent. Brilliant. Thank okay. Um, so I think we'll hand over the reins then to Josh, um, who will take us through um, the the power platform side of uh, tonight's meetup and talk about uh, Power Automate and error handling. Awesome. Yep. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Aaron. So I'm just sharing my screen here, and I'll also put on my video <clears throat> okay so you guys can see my screen yeah we can see it <laughs> sorry okay. I myself off mute. <laughs> <laughs> wait a second <laughs> okay so 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 yeah so uh, for this session, we will be talking, uh, just going over the basics and, and kind of skimming through it because of the amount of time. But we uh, definitely, after the end of the session, I really hope that everyone is able to learn something with error handling and actually implement it into their um, Power Automate flows or logic apps if you use that. So, so uh, about me, uh, so my name is Josh Cook and I'm an integration developer at Interpipeline. It's a uh, energy company in uh, Canada, Alberta, and I am a Microsoft MVP in business applications. Um, so actually, my 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 day, I usually am in Azure using Logic Apps and integration services. But uh, on my free time, I'm I'm always in the Power Platform using every single part of it, and uh, very passionate about it. I'm actually a super user on the Power Automate community forums. So if you have any questions or if your flows are broken and you need some help or if you're stuck somewhere, 
the community forum is definitely a place to go. Uh, there's so many super users on there, and uh, I think our answer rate is like above 60 or 70 percent within 24 hours. So uh, you get answers really quick there. Uh, you you can scan my uh, QR code right there. It looks like a really weird QR code. It does work. Uh, it'll bring you to my link tree, which has uh, links to my blog, um, LinkedIn, Twitter. Follow me anywhere you like. If you want to connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter, that's uh, just send me an invite. And a little bit about me personally is uh, I actually have ADHD. So if you see my storytelling going a little wonky, like at the bottom there, um, don't worry, I will revert back to the top uh, top end. Uh, so I try to stay on the top end, but sometimes it goes a little crazy. Um, blockchain is actually one of the first technologies I really got into. I actually built a blockchain and I'm actually really into a lot of cryptocurrencies, uh, including Bitcoin and a lot of uh, the altcoins or the the, the, like the lower uh, coins that nobody's really ever heard of, but they might they might come into play in real world world at some point. I'm also really big into uh, space, so I like I used to like watching space documentaries and stuff like that. But I've actually got a couple telescopes recently, and uh, it's been amazing looking through that. I'm trying to get my son into it. He's only he's going to be three years old very soon here, so he actually looks like uh, likes looking at the moon, which is really nice. Uh, gaming. So I used to game on the Xbox all the time, and um, since since getting married and having a family, I, I don't game that much anymore. Mainly just on the Switch with like Nintendo and stuff like that, and and Mario Maker with my son, just small things like that. I will I do want to get back into Xbox though. So definitely my favorite system. So for today's agenda, um, just going to be going over uh, like what is error handling, um, and basically we're going to use try catch finally for that, and uh, we're going to go over what that is, and why we should use it. Uh, the structure of how to use it inside of Power Automate, and then we're going to go through some demos and, and uh, Q&A. So what is error handling? So I actually like to treat my errors like I do my Pokemon, and I like to catch them all. So I don't want to leave an error uh, unturned or not caught. Uh, it'll, it messes up with processes later on down the road. So what basically, what is it? So we're going to acknowledge the error. So even if we don't know what the error is, we wanna, um, you wanna think that your flow will never fail, but it will. Even if you don't know what the error is or might be, you still wanna acknowledge and handle it in some way. And I'll show that uh, in the later demo. Um, we also wanna deal with the logic, um, like logic to deal with the error. So that could be um, logging the error in like a SharePoint list or even sending the error off in, a, in an email or a Teams message just to acknowledge that uh, the error is there and then the logic to deal with it. So if you have a support team that you want to send it off to, that uh, makes perfect sense. So then you can do it that way. And then lastly, you want to gracefully finish the run. So what that means is usually when there's an error in Power Automate or in your flow, uh, the flow run, if you look at the history, it says failed. Now, in most cases, you kind of want it to do that. But in other cases where you do handle the error properly and maybe you fix it or maybe you send it back to the person that's doing the request or the process, you might want to show that run as successful. So you maybe you want to do that instead of showing in there. So all of this sounds great, but how do we actually do this inside uh, Flow? So we use Try Catch Finally. So a really high overview because Try Catch Finally is usually um, used in like programming and like actual like dev code. Excuse me. So when I I actually come from a dev background, and I never actually thought we could implement try catch finally or anything like that in Power Automate. I was very wrong. Um, I'm in mean, uh, the very beginning stages of my Power Auto or Power Platform um, career, I guess. I didn't implement any uh, error handling, and it, it it bites you in the butt later on. Uh, it might not, but it might. And if it does, then it's it's just a pain to figure out how to fix it and deal with the error, especially if um, it's such a, <laughs> if the errors come way down the road, you might not even uh, remember how the process works. So to understand what try catch finally is, we got to understand what try is. And so try is basically the initial steps or actions that we want to um, basically run within the process. So if you have flows right now that have no error handling, basically everything in that flow is going to be your try. So then what is the catch? So the catch basically catches any errors that happen in the try. So if something bad happens in try or some data quality is messing things up and there's an error, 
this is what catch is going to do. Catch is going to grab that error and it's going to do something with it. And no matter no matter if there's an error or not, if try does not have an error or if cat, or if try does have an error, you're always going to want to do a finally in because that finally is basically um, you want to it, it's basically running any all the steps or sorry it's running it's it's basically what you want to run after uh, everything no matter what. So if try happens uh, correctly and you don't you don't catch anything, you still want to do finally. But if you catch something, you still want to do finally. And to understand this a little bit easier, there's a great analogy that I like to use. And this is basically, I use this because of COVID, because uh, I can't go anywhere. So in my example, I'm going to go on my vacation. And it starts today. So I'm going to go to my nice beach island that you see there. So how am I going to get there? I'm going to drive. So driving to my beach vacation in my nice cyber truck, my Tesla, um, I'm driving there. And that's my try. Something happens. Now this could be my maybe it breaks down. Maybe I get pulled over by a police car. Now I don't know why I'm getting pulled over. I can get a speeding ticket. Maybe my taillights burn <laughs> out. Maybe something. I don't know what it is. Regardless of what it is, I'm gonna get to my beach vacation or I'm gonna get to my destination. So that's gonna be my finally. So my finally is getting to my beach vacation. Regardless if I get a ticket or not, or if he lets me go, or if he just pulled me over because he wanted to say hi. Whatever it is, uh, after the fact, <laughs> I'm getting to my beach vacation. So, why should we use it? Now, I really want people in the chat to let me know if you, any of you have seen this email before. If you build flows or Power Automate, whatever you want to call them, and you, they have failed before, you probably have seen this email. Now, this email looks great and it sounds great. And this is originally what I thought was great when I was first using um, uh, Microsoft Flow at the time, but Power Automate. And I was like, oh, that's sweet. If it fails, Microsoft's going to let me know. The problem is, is that Microsoft lets you know, but they, it lets you know maybe like a day. It could be a couple of days. It could be even just maybe an hour. But it also could be a week later that you get this email. So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I've actually gotten this email like about a week later. So I had some flows fail on Monday and I had no idea they failed because there's no error handling and it just kind of failed, failed, failed. And then on, on like Thursday or Friday, I get an email. Hey, your flows failed. I'm like, oh, OK. You know, I click on I it tells me the name of the flow right there. I go click on it. I check. I'm like, wait a second. This flow has been failing since Monday. Now I'm now I'm in a panic, right? Because now I'm trying to figure all this out. And um, did definitely not the way to go. So. <laughs> The point I'm trying to get across is that all flows will fail eventually. Uh, we just have to know how to handle those errors. Because if you don't know how to handle them, they're just going to pile up. And again, you might not even know that it's failing. Oh, wh again, why should we use it? Send alerts to better support failures, uh, which saves money. Uh, you monitor the flows, um, support the flows. So that's, again, sending a support team's notification on failures, send notifications to users for visibility. And um, error handling also gives you more control because it captures the failing data, uh, which can actually help you build better flows in the future. Because uh, you'll be able to know how to, um, like, kind of like what's expected if, of certain um, scenarios. So, uh, yeah. So basically, the flow structure. So how how do we implement this in in uh, Power Automate? We use uh, this action called a scope. Now, if you haven't used scopes before, they are awesome, even if you don't use try, catch, finally, or anything like that, because basically you can put all a bunch of different actions inside a scope. So it, it'll clean your flow up. So even if you uh, even if you have a couple of processes like within your flow and you wanna you wanna kind of group it together to make it more uh, meaningful, or uh, if somebody else is coming in and checking it out, you might wanna like kind of guide them like, oh, maybe this portion does the onboarding and this portion sends approvals. So you might wanna have two different scopes for that. In this case, we're going to use scopes for um, doing our try catch finally. So we're going to have a try block, uh, a catch block, and a finally block. And the way we do the try catch finally in here is that we use this uh, setting in Power Automate called configure run after. Now this, and I will show showcase this more in a demo. But basically, what it's going to do is it's going to you're basically going to configure the catch block to only run, only execute if the try block, the one above it, has failed or skipped or um, timed out. And what that's going to do is that's going to be able to make it run only if there's an error, because if that's technically what's going to happen. 
Uh, finally, in the finally block, and I've actually forgotten to do this a couple of times. Finally, you you want to also use configure run after because by default, uh, the scopes and actions they run only if the above action is successful. So in this case, for finally, we again we want to run finally anytime if there's a failure, if it's successful. So we want to run it no matter what. So that's why we also uh, use configure run after to uh, basically check mark all those different options there. So on to the demo. So I will showcase a demo here on it. So if I go here, so I'm going to create a brand new flow just called try catch finally structure. So I'm going to hit create. Now again, this is just going to be the structure. Also, I'm going to show a really cool way to throw an error um, and not actually terminate the process. And I'll show that in a second. So again, we're going to use scopes. So I can easily just type in scope. And there's scope right there. And immediately I like to change the name. So I'm going to put this as try. And I'm going to just do it three more times. So it also a quick thing, you can actually click in this control here because it's part of the control uh, group. And it's right there, scope. So now we're going to name this one catch. And then the last one here will be finally. So now, now we have the actions. Now we got to do the configure run after. So basically, how do we do that? So in every action, there is a th the three dots here. And this is where you have a configure run after here. So that's perfect. So click that. Again, I, like I said, successful is always by default. What I want to do is this is, uh, it's, basically, it's basically saying, I'm doing this on the catch block. It's basically saying, uh, if the scope try is succeeded, has is successful, we're going to run this. Notice as I add check marks here, it's going to tell me what it's going to do when this is going to run. So I do not want it to run if it's successful, only if it's failed, skipped, or timed out. So that's going to do is now if try fails, and now you can see that with the red arrow there. And if you highlight over here, it tells you. It doesn't tell you exactly. I really wish it told you what the values were, but it doesn't. It just says. Uh, you'll have to check under configure run after to, to view that. So now the finally, which is the one I always forget, uh, is because <laughs> uh, if you don't do this, and <laughs> it's most likely not going to run. So you have to configure run after here and check mark all of them. Now, be be aware if you got if anyone does this, um, if you move these actions around, it breaks the configure run after. So this is another reason why I like to use scopes because if you're using this on an individual actions like. Um, Let's say if you have a like a variable or something, and then you're moving that variable around. Every time you move it, it breaks that connection. So, in, in scopes, like if I have a bunch of stuff in my try and I'm dragging them around, it's not going to break anything in here as long as I don't move catch like above try and vice versa. So anyway, what I want to do is I want to showcase something so uh, quickly. So if I put in the catch here, there's two th ways to kind of like fail your flow if you need to. So I'm going to showcase one here. It's called terminate. Oh, I did that wrong. So it's in control again the category and it's called terminate so if you if anyone's used this before i'm sure you know what it does but these values here pointless they don't do anything you can't do anything with it because you'll see why in a second so basically if i put this actually in my try it's going to fail so my my try should fail my catch technically should run but what we're going to find out here is that it's not going to run <laughs> so flow run failed that's what i wanted is I'm failing that flow with the terminate action. But here's here's where the weird thing is. My catch says it's skipped. It's not going to run uh, because terminate works differently than a regular error. Terminate terminates the whole process, the whole flow. So be aware of that if you're going to use terminate. Um, and if you need to use something where, again, if, if something's happening and you're doing some data validation within your try before, before you want to uh, maybe update CDS, update SharePoint, whatever you want to do, you want to do some data validation first. If something's wrong, you might not want to terminate the flow. You might want to just, um, you might just want to like show that there's an error. So how do we do that? So if I get rid of, because you might want to run, you might want to run the catch block. And again, <laughs> using terminate, your catch isn't going to run. So a really cool way, and I'll be curious to know if if any of you have other ideas of how to do uh, how to force an error. I'd love to hear it also in the chat, which I'll check after. But the way I've always been doing it. And I've, I've never really seen anyone do this before. So what I'm going to use, I'm going to use a variable. So we use a variable. I'm just going to name it 
uh, force error. And I'll just name it force error right here. And I'm going to name it, I'm going to put it as a integer. And you'll see why in a second. So if I go in my try and I go uh, set my variable now. So here's my set variable. You always have to initialize first and then set. So I'm going to select my force error here. And if I go to my expression tab, I'm not going to do anything crazy, so don't worry. But I'm just going to put true. And what that's going to do is I'm going to use a Boolean expression value here, true. So why is that important? Because when I run this, now, my, now everything works properly. So what happens here? So I'm setting the variable with a value that's, that can't be set. Uh, it's basically I'm trying to put a true value inside an integer, which is a number. So it fails, and then it pushes it to my catch. I can't open it. There's nothing inside my catch. There's no actions in there, but you could see that it ran. So if I had something in here to catch some errors or to, to do something with that error, um, I would be able to do it in there. And then finally, you'd run it no matter what. So this is all great and everything. Now let's see a real use case of this. So I do want to show uh, a use case that actually, it's a smaller use case that I actually is a real use case. But anyway, so what, and it actually was in my organization before. So we had a form that uh, stakeholders could fill out to add them, like to add their users to like their power apps and stuff like that. And what we did is we just used the form to add them to the environment, like a uh, CDS environment. And um, it also gave them, uh, it also added them to the, uh, an Azure Active Directory group. So that could also be attached to licensing. It could be also attached to even access to an environment as well. Uh, so the problem is, is that um, when I, so here I can even showcase this. So here's the flow. So this is my, this is my form here. What I'm basically saying is, give me some email addresses separated by a semicolon. And how does the flow work? This is all attached to a flow. So here's the regular flow, no error handling. So I have my form here. It's when a response is submitted and I'm getting the, getting the response. That's the typical uh, form trigger in action. I'm composing the user email. Compose action, you can put anything in there. You can use expressions in there. Love it. I love compose. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm actually, if I just, uh, I'm going to copy this out and paste it into the comments here so we can read it a little better. So basically, what am I doing here? So a little sketchy, but so split, I'm splitting the get response details. This is that question of, email address. So I'm splitting each email address. You can see that there on that semicolon. So I'm splitting each email address on the semicolon. So now it's going to basically take that array or that um, list of emails and put it and basically have one email per, per uh, loop here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to check to make sure that that email address is in my uh, Office 365 users, because I don't want to be giving access <laughs> to external users at this point, for, the, for this use case at least. So what I'm doing is I'm just doing that so I can validate that they are part of my Office 365 and get the UPN, even though their email address usually is the UPN, but uh, it, it, it doesn't matter. So basically, then I'm just adding them to this uh, Active Directory group, and that's going to give them uh, licensing, access to environments, uh, access to a bunch of different things. Then I'm just going to send an email off to whoever fills out the form about all the users that were added. So great, let's see this in action. So if I go um, my form here, and I do have do my first pass, I'll just copy that, go back. I'm going to paste that in there. So now I have a bunch of users I'm going to add. I hit submit. So if I go back to my flow, not that one, it's this one here. Back. So nine seconds ago, it has failed. I wonder why. So user not found. OK, yeah. So again, there's my flow. Four users that detected four email addresses. It looks like this one has succeeded properly. There's no errors. If I go to next failed, it looks like the second iteration failed. Oh, I see. The person that actually, it's not an actual email. It's a first name, last name. And the next failed, same thing. So it's just data validation, wrong data. So. Again, they're not, it's not, they're not being added to the group. And if you look, because there's an error in here, there is no email being sent at all. So the person that, that fills out the form has no idea that this is uh, 
failing or that the users that they're doing are even being added in there. So how do we add error handling to this? So usually I would build this on the fly, but for the sake of time, I do have the, basically the same flow. I'm just going to disable this flow, turn off. Got to love this new message. Check this out. It's basically saying, hey, there's a potential problem with your flow. <laughs> yeah, it's turned off. Um, <laughs> so if I go over here, um, here's, so here's my other flow. It's turned off. I'm going to turn it on now. This is the same flow, just with error handling. So if I hit edit, just to show what's going on here. So basically, we have the same type of thing, except I have two new things here. These are two variables I'm using. They're array variables. So I'm basically saying valid. Uh, valid. So I'm going to put all valid emails in here. I'm going to put all invalid emails in this one. So I have two variables, valid and invalid. So now I have my try. So in my try, what am I doing in my try? So I'm basically doing the same thing with that, with my split uh, expression to, to get each individual email. And then same thing with the apply to each, but here's where it gets interesting. So my apply to each, same things happening where I'm grabbing the current user, or the current email, except now I'm, split, I'm doing a parallel branch. And the way you do that is you just basically, when you're hitting a new action, you can do parallel branch. What parallel branch does is it basically runs these two actions the same time what, like when it needs to, if it's going down. But in this case, uh, since I'm using a catch, I'm basically saying if I go in my configure run after here, I'm only so when my get user profile has failed, skipped, or timed out, I'm gonna run my catch, which basically just appends because it is a, a, a an array. So append just means add. So I'm just adding the invalid email to that array. And I'll show why later in a second. So, but if it if it is successful, and if I just, there's no point in doing this, but again, get user profile. If it's successful, that's where I'm going to go in this branch. So what this is going to do is it's going to do the same thing as before, add the member to the group, but also I'm appending that email to the valid array. Now, why is this all important? So when I close this off, and here's my finally. So again, with my finally, I'm just going to confirm because I always forget. It is all selected. So again, I want to make it run no matter what. Uh, so again, so now what am I doing? Just to showcase this better, I am, uh, I hate that it does that. So what I'm doing is I'm basically grabbing the length of valid array. What this is doing, so because it's an array, the length expression is going to count how many uh, like items are in that array or list. So in this case, I'm doing that because and I'm doing that for invalid and valid. The reason why I'm doing that is because I don't want to send an email off to the person if there's in if there's no invalid emails. Um, so just to showcase this, so condition if valid emails. So for uh, if if the val if the outputs of that uh, of this up here, the compose. So let's say if this equals two, so there's two valid emails. So if it's greater than zero, which it would be, then I'm going to and it's funny, I'm doing it this way because it wouldn't let me reference the variable. If I click in here in the dynamic content, it does that sometimes. Uh, you, there's no variable, even if I, I wonder if I type it actually. Uh, yeah, that's, that's weird why well, it doesn't show up. But uh, so what I did is I just actually added that variable to a compose. Again, compose is awesome. So I'm doing this and now I'm basically just sending an email to the person who filled up the form saying, hey, these users have been added to the group. And those are the valid emails. Now, if I go over here into the other condition, it's going to do the, almost the same thing. Uh, I'm just doing the same thing. I'm grabbing the an invalid array, and I'm basically going to send the same email almost, just saying users not added. These users have not been added to the group. So let's test this out. So if I go back to my form here, and I do have some new users I can test this on. Second pass right here. I'll copy this. And then oh, I'll go back to my form. And I'm going to paste in this new string here. Hey, fingers crossed. So let's go back to the flow and see how that worked. Back. And seven seconds ago, and I, I, I hear I'm hearing dinging in my headset. I mean, I'm getting some emails, which is good. So it's saying my flow was ran successfully. And if I go in here, my try, 
we see that the same type of thing is happening where there's a failed record in there. So for the first one, everything's good. Added to the group, got appended to that valid email list. That's this email here, demo user at flowaltdelete.ca. Next failed, that's the second one. Again, they don't exist in, in, uh, in uh, Office 365, so they get pushed over here. It pens it to it pens this email here, spam at email.com, to the invalid array. And it's going to do that for every single record. If this one's failed, it's going to unknown at dot user. And then the next one is successful, which it puts into the valid. And if we scroll down, we should be getting yet. Yeah, see, so now we're checking the length, the length of valid, two, and the length of invalid, it should also be two. And then we're just sending the emails off. And I do have my email open in another tab here which I will show, I'll bring them over. So here is the, um, once it loads. So that's, this is the users not added and it's telling me exactly the users that were not added spam and unknown user. And then my other one here is the success users have been added and this is the correct emails here. And just to showcase that I'm not lying, if I go into my, um azure here i go to groups and then here's the one i'm adding everyone to in here and i go members so and there's everyone here from the first run joanna and henrita and flow support and demo user is the second run so that is that concludes my demos i will go back to my slides here i do have something else on here so yeah demo time so the key takeaways are configure run after. <laughs> I've, I've forgotten to do the finally, and even sometimes at the catch, you always want to test to make sure that everything is going good, um, that everything's running properly. You want to, and again, if you want to test to make sure that if an error happens, the other ones run, use that variable technique to uh, force an error, just to see if, see if everything runs correctly. And then make sure finally, again, I, I've forgotten, make sure all those things are checkmarked for finally. And use terminate when you need to terminate the whole flow processing. If you don't, if you want to stop everything and just fail it, use that, and then use the variable technique that I showed to, um, sorry, to um, keep the processing going and then also force an error. So that does conclude my session. Thank you all for listening, and I'm looking forward to looking at the chat here. Uh, if you guys have any questions, and I do thank you. And again, connect with me if you like. Um, I will accept it. So let's check out the chat here. All right. Yeah, that's, that's brilliant. Thank you, Josh. No problem. I think so there's uh, having... certainly a few a few points there that you know wasn't fully aware of. So um, yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, I'm hoping that there are some things there that everyone found useful. I think the um, the important thing for me is, you know, someone submitting something and then expecting a flow to do something. If that flow fails, that one, the user wasn't, you know, isn't aware of it failing, and two, IT not aware of it failing. So it sort of sits in that limbo, limbo world. So um, yeah, yeah, it's really good. It's, it's a bit different, isn't it, to having a sort of a web application or a an error message prompted on the screen and you know for one it hasn't done what it, it's meant to have done so um yeah really exactly. good thank you yeah no problem uh, uh, yeah i don't i don't think there's any questions yeah um, i'm just re i'm just reading the comments yeah thanks everyone for being so uh uh active on the chat there yeah i think that's that's, that's definitely one to add to the uh the, the best practice uh Toolbox, isn't it? You know, just better way of coding flows. So um, yeah, really good. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Really good. Right. Well, um, we'll hand over to Alex uh, then, if he's not finished his bottle of wine. No, I've been good. I've not opened yet. It's ready to go. But uh, <laughs> I've, I've been a good boy. Right. Uh, so, yeah, Josh. Thank you. Okay, while Thank I load you. this up, um, just off the back of what Josh was saying there, actually, um, I completely agree about the best practice principle of that. It's something we put in as policy on all of our client flows, and it's whenever it fails, it posts to a database and it also sends through to our service desk. And it's one of those things, once it's in, you wonder why you ever did without it, and it's, it's brilliant. 
Right, so that screen should hopefully be loading up. And good evening. Uh, my name's Alex Franklin. I'm a senior consultant with a company called Cielo Costa. And um, my session tonight is it's a little bit more back to basics, I think. And um, I was contacted by Aaron. We'd been speaking a couple of months ago. And back in early December, he asked if I wanted to talk here. And I thought I would because I've not done one of these before. And um, he said about the subject matter. And I thought, right, I'm not entirely sure what I would talk about. But then I reflected back on the previous year, especially, but the previous two years about things that have bitten me and uh, all bits in, in various places with regards to choices made of platforms and approaches and um, saw that maybe this is perhaps an opportunity to vent and talk through some of those things of where we've hit certain things with platforms and with the limitations or licensing associated and there's this is a topic that I think could quite easily be covered over the course of many hours and so condensing it into 30 minutes is a little bit of a challenge so it's it's cutting some corners along the way and um, so apologies for that um, but it's covering based on really the experience I've had and with my colleagues as well over the last couple of years with some of the things we've hit and um, to, just to start with a disclaimer based on me there so I'm, I'm going to be talking about three key areas in this but um, I'm not a developer um, I, I, I kind of wish I was but I'm, my brain just isn't unfortunately wired that way and it hasn't been since the days of my beloved domino in the late 90s and so my role is really more focused on the business facing lead of a project and um, change management and pre-sales but I do I get heavily involved with the lead of those projects and helping with these decisions um, while being guided by those that probably know more than I do and on that note the final part of this disclaimer moving on a lot of what I'm talking about here is obviously it's not it's not gospel it's my a lot of my opinions based on stuff that's happened stuff that has infuriated me but pleased me in other cases and so I'm sure there are lots of people on this call that may have perhaps slightly differing opinions which is all good it's um, one of the many things on the list of reasons why it's a shame these things aren't in person because it's the kind of topic that I would, I would love to have a post session beer and talk to other people to see what their views are and what they think but for, for this what I'm really running through is three areas of focus for this brief 30 minute stint and talking through um, SPFX within SharePoint, Power Apps and custom web apps um, in the experience we've had of doing customers you are hosted. And talking through all of these and where certain things may, may work better than others and things you may hit. And it always starts with the same thing when perhaps customers are looking for a solution, they might be new on a journey and they're going down that road and they expect that there's, there's a silver bullet, there's one thing they can use and there's one thing they can bring in that's going to give them everything they possibly want but the reality is as most people know there is no silver bullet when we're looking at perhaps the custom web app approach to things granted it could probably do absolutely anything you want it doesn't make it the right choice um I, i'd love a ferrari because i like driving quite fast but it's not the right choice for me um because it's it's the walnut and sledgehammer thing there's different things to take into consideration with this and when you're deciding which platform it is that you're going to be using it starts obviously with the questions and with the questions we get the requirements and it's always about asking the right questions and I've taken a, a small hand-picked few of some of the questions for this obviously given the uh, times of these sessions but when we first start to think about this about what we're going to use and how we're going to use it and we think about the complexity and now th this is something that a lot of these things can differ based on time I, I've had a project in the last year that started out being pretty simple and it was very straightforward I thought yeah do you know what this is a business critical thing you need and just because it's business critical it doesn't mean you need to be complex business criticality can often be best achieved through simplicity and so I thought do you know what? awesome it's a simple thing let's do a power app and um, scope changed as the project went on and um, changed quite significantly and it did maybe later regret that decision because I think that we would have been better perhaps with something like SPFX um, because I found with Power Apps I, I'm very very fond of them and I have been I played with them since the days of uh, Project Sienna I think it was called I was quite a fan of InfoPath and shed a little tear when that demise came around um, but I, I find that Power Apps tend to be better when you do keep it that, that bit more simple you have a smaller set of requirements 
Um, I personally, because I don't do the physical delivery, but I use them a lot when I'm doing proof of concepts, because for me as a non-developer or perhaps a citizen developer, should we say, um, I can build them quite quickly and relatively easily and get them looking pretty good. Um, once you start to get onto the lots of screens, lots of logic, lots of linkings and all sorts of different things, it tends to perhaps fall out of favour when compared to the likes of SPFX, where you are able to get a bit more complexity into what you're building in a bit more of a rigid manner and a bit more of a sturdy, reliable manner. And complex, obviously, going over to a, a custom web app approach, whatever you want, it's there. Um, but it doesn't make it right. And thinking about how it's going to be shared. So this is one of the things that has bugged me about um, Power Apps um, was the external sharing side of things and how we could only really use them when it was internal facing for those in our organization. But now it, it has introduced external sharing, but um, it does have some, some constraints to it. Um, for example, I, um, I think I'm right in saying that if somebody externally is accessing my Power App, they do need a Power Apps license. You do have the um, Power Portal, of course, but when we're talking Power Apps, you do have those limitations that way. And it also means that with the security, it's a little bit more fiddly as well. SharePoint is, um, as SPFX is, is slightly easier. You do still have that slightly more manual way of managing it, perhaps, unless you build something to manage it for you. Um, but you can have the external sharing, but the benefit there is you don't worry about licenses. Um, as is with the way with SharePoint and always has been with SharePoint Online. You can share externally free of charge. You don't have to worry if you're sharing it with someone who's never touched Microsoft. If it's a Microsoft account that they have, they come in and they use it. But there are limitations, obviously. If you have your SPFX web part on a SharePoint page and you put in the people web part, so you have, say, staff to contact, while it shows them, you don't get the links through to their profiles. and stuff like that that you find that makes it not quite there but it is often good enough custom of course internal and external you can have it completely public facing no authentication um, connecting in with different authentication providers like google twitter facebook whatever you need it's there but with the expertise the time potentially the cost that goes with it when we're talking about supporting mobile devices Something that really did get me excited about Power Apps at the start was the Power Apps native app and the ability for us to send apps out to um, our people, our customers, whatever they may be, and have them locally on their device, on their phone or on their tablet. And I like it. It's all right. Um, I, I, do, I have found in the past it's been a bit tricky when you have to maintain perhaps multiple apps depending on devices. I know that there is some semblance of responsive. I'm not sure how fond I am of it with Power Apps, but... Um, mobile through the browser with SPFX, it's all fully responsive and I love it. I think it's really nice and smooth. It does work very well. It's pretty simple, but you don't get the native mobile apps on that. So it depends on the use case of how people need to use that, which is touched upon in a moment. And again, obviously, custom web apps. Um, you have all these things that I won't start to talk about because I'll quickly be exposed about not truly understanding how they work. but you have all these options there and you have these things available to be able to build these native apps and these different things that you want to do based on your own requirements. And offline is where I, I, I really do favour Power Apps and I've been a big fan of it for the way you can make it work with offline. Um, I don't find it's the most common of requirements these days to be able to get offline access to stuff. People tend to almost prefer that, that web-based approach and it's with power. So, for example, I've in over the last couple of years, I've had a fair few instances where people have needed an auditing app. And um, an example of a couple of those would be a health and safety audit or a fire safety audit. And in certain cases, particularly with the, with the fire safety with this one customer, they needed to have a um, app that they would have on a tablet and they would use it on their tablet walking around where their Wi-Fi was patchy. They didn't have um, SIM card in it and they needed to be able to go outside and inspect smoking areas and all these different things. So they needed offline. Power Apps is awesome for that kind of thing because you can have it so that you load it up, it pulls data down and it stores it locally in data stores and you open the app up when you're offline and it can check if you're on or offline, use that local data store so that you can populate your lookup values and things like that from central taxonomies, whatever it may be. Complete your form, save it, and then have it pushed back up when you're next online. And I love Power Apps for that. It's one of my favorite things. SPFX, 
Um, no offline support. It is truly web-based. Not, it's not a huge problem really these days anymore. It's, it's the requirements for offline, I think, has, tend to be slightly less in my experience. Other roles may differ depending on your customers, of course, but the custom approach, offline is possible. Um, I believe it is um, of varying complexities. But in this case, I, I love Power Apps for that because it's something that's actually quite straightforward to implement and use. And one that uh, I, I recently have ended up in quite a lengthy discussion about is the amount of data that we're dealing with. Um, with Power Apps, I've, I've had scenarios where we um, built small scale asset management solutions in uh, Power Apps that were probably going to be going, say, up to a thousand items. And it, it was all good and it was OK. But once it started going above that 2000 limit, we were hitting problems because people were wanting to use drop downs in the app to run searches across a SharePoint list for all of those items. And we weren't getting those items showing up because we were going over these limits of what we can get in. It's one thing to use a power to push data out, and that's not a problem. But getting it in is sometimes difficult if you're looking at larger scale. SPFX improves upon that. It allows us a lot more power. Um, we can have SPFX pointing to lists that are nice and big and working with them. Um, so good. you do then hit that um, question of if you're using SharePoint for large amounts of data, you've got the 5,000 item list view threshold. Um, if you prepare in advance, you can work around it. But to be honest, I think I've, in, over the many years, been stung. And while I know lists can handle these millions of items and you can do it if you prepare, on, it's honest, the fact that you have to prepare makes me nervous and it makes me not want to do it in SharePoint as a result of that. But I know we've got a list at the moment that are way higher than that and it works. It just still makes me that bit uncomfortable. And it goes without saying, if we're going custom and we have a database there, if we're dealing with really large amounts of data, it might be better anyway. Put it in a database and then you've got, it's not a problem anymore. It's nothing to worry about. And then you access it through here. You can then connect to it through SPFX and Power Apps. Um, so you can mix the three, the three together, but consideration. And with the security, security within SharePoint and Power Apps being slightly limited, um, that you have the Azure AD approaches. Um, not sure how often people do need to go really beyond that, um, but you do have the benefit when you're looking at the custom approach that you can have true public facing. So someone can open up a form and have no authentication whatsoever to be able to do what they need to do. Or you can build your own custom approach onto it where it starts validating based on data that you know about them that kind of thing. Time and cost. How quick do we need it? If the last year is anything to go by, um, anybody else that works in the area of consulting, every single phone call that I've had over the last year has been something that it's not a case of we've got this project, let's plan it carefully and let's get it, let's get it done in the right amount of time. 90% is a case of we need this now, now, now. And when you're looking at the actual truth of how quick something needs to be done compared to or perhaps should be done to get it done right. Power Apps is often one of the better approaches when it comes to speed. You can have a quick to start, quick to build. It's that low code, no code approach and the graphical interface, the citizen developer approach that can do it. If it isn't too complex, you can have the Power App up and running a lot faster than you probably can in other scenarios. Though saying that, with the medium complexity or the medium time associated, in with SPFX, I have seen experienced developers build things in SPFX faster than it would take some people in a power app. So it can depend on the experience, but the medium term can be down to the SPFX where you have um, certain accelerated starts as well that you can get, but you do need the development side of it, which can take longer. When we're going custom, that's what might take far longer. We might be looking at spinning up environments and then you have certificates and then you have all these other things to be applied and then you have the build from the ground up of what you're doing. Granted there are reusable components and there are elements you can use and application templates but more often than not that's the longer scale one. I mean I, I work with a customer who they have a third party that manage their environments for them and if we were to if we had a requirement and we decided SPFX I know that we could have it built within a few days perhaps. Um, that same approach in custom would be closer to a month because of the time that it takes, um, the lead time to get these environments spun up and correctly managed and tested as well. And testing is always that thing that 
adds that bit of extra time to it. But it all depends on what's the right choice for your circumstance. Uh, and then we think about the team. Most developers, a thing that I don't like about Power Apps is the lack of ability to have multiple developers working on the same app at the same time. Um, having that single approach and the locked environment of check in, check out, hand over. SPFX and custom support co-development fully. If you're using co-branching, local development, and pushing things through and merging them in and sending it away, it's all good. And it's, it allows you to have that team. So if you need something that is of relative complexity, but you can throw more people at it, then perhaps option two and three are the better approach for what you need there. But you may not have the skill set, so it may be going to Power Apps to do it. And then I'll touch upon this a little bit more um, when there may be a slight more, slightly greater tone of aggression in my voice when I talk about it with the licensing. Um, you need to think about what we're going to be factoring into it. So getting those questions right at the start about what we need to do, how we need to do it, and where we need to do it. Do we need to connect to other things? Just all those little bits to gather the information before the decision is made. Because if you have a power app, I mentioned earlier, we had a project where the scope just dramatically increased halfway through. And it was on a power app and it was it was really straightforward at the start. And it was going to fulfill a very critical business need. But then halfway through, um, there was lightning bolts coming down and it was all demanded. No, it must now go through a custom API and it's got to get this central source of data and we, we cannot have this any other way. Cracking. OK, well, you're rolling this out to a whole ton of people who now don't have the license for it because it means you've got to up your license on Power Apps to do that. Um, so you do need to think about licensing and what you're using. With SPFX, obviously, it's just a SharePoint license, and that does allow those connections through to those other areas without the additional licenses. Obviously, there are third party ones you might pay for, but it does take away that issue. And if I could turn back time for that circumstance, at least I would have gone SPFX rather than Power Apps. And then custom, obviously, no licensing required for that. It's, it's yours. You, you own the environment. You, you own the house. You choose what you want to do with the rooms. But that, that's something I have found in cases where, because I'm, I've always been so careful about making sure those things are captured, but sometimes it's unavoidable. Uh, a quick one on reusability. Um, reuse is possible with Power Apps. I mean, there are times maybe you could create a base template Power App. Um, things like, for example, when you're talking about having styles that according to a custom brand that you have. So rather than having to rebuild that brand into a Power App, and you could build like a, an admin screen where you put a text box and you put the font and you put the color and you put a button and you put all these bits. And then every other element across your Power App inherits from that. Same now as a template, reuse. It's great. It is a big time saver. Um, but you do have a better element of reuse when you're going down the custom route in the SPFX side of things, in the custom side of things, the different components that you can get, and downloads and everything else that you can use. So if it's reusability, circumstances dictate. And then touched upon it as well, team skills and supportability. So with the non-developers, Power Apps is, is going to be the option for that unless you're a wizard, Google copy, paste and decipher as you go through into something in SPFX, which is unfortunately what I would need to do. So I stick with Power Apps to build the many things I need to do. Um, and I leave that for the others that are far more knowledgeable. But Power Apps is great for that side of thing with the no code, no code. I remember when it first came out, Microsoft was saying that anyone in your business can build a Power App. Anyone can do this. And I let's do it immediately. Thought, no, that's, that's not true. You, you've got to have some, you've got to have some nows about you to do this. Um, it can be very, very fiddly, but it's one of those things, it's a bit more, it's easy when you know. And I quite liked it because the formula in it reminded me a lot of Excel and I'm a big fan of Excel and I get mocked for it much as I do my earlier statement about being a domino lover back in the 90s, but to each his or her own. Um, so with SharePoint, SPFX, you do have some development required on that. It is code driven in the web parts, but you do have that ability to build a SharePoint site around it. And custom, obviously, is full on, build from the ground up, get your tools. Maintaining these, source control is probably not um, Power Apps' strong point. And so it can be very hard to track what's been changed in code within it. 
So maintenance going forward, if you're having revisions of it and tracking back through is very, very difficult at times in Power Apps. With SPFX and uh, Custom, you do have that ability to track changes in your source code as you go through and see things historically and manage it that bit better. But if maintenance isn't that huge a concern, you are able to be stringent in it to be able to manage what has been changed in your power app, doesn't make it the wrong choice. But I have seen times where a simple change can quite easily cause carnage in a lot of ways over a, over a more complicated app and then trying to trace it back to what was changed can be very painful. And this one is, um, I will always think of uh, my colleague, um, our principal consultant, who is a mad stickler for good coding practices, and so he very well should be, because uh, the proof is in the pudding, as they say. And good coding practices are uh, perhaps tricky, perhaps time consuming when it comes to power apps. Um, you do have limited coding expressions within it, but, and the review process, if you're doing, say, code reviews at the different stages of your project, it's just a little bit harder, it's a little bit more monotonous, or in some cases a lot more monotonous when you're using Power Apps if you want to maintain these standards. Going forward to the other two solutions, being dev products and dev approaches, you do get to have those better standards. You write your code on your own dev environment, you have your pull request, you have your review, you have your push through to sit sets wherever it goes. And they do give you that ability to manage things that bit better. And um, when this was first implemented, I mean, much like actually when it was first implemented for um, Flows, when we did the stuff that Josh covered in the previous session, I was looking at it thinking, my God, that is so much more work for everyone to do if we're going to follow these practices. But then you see them in action and you think, yeah, there's the, you can't deny that's the right way to do it. And it's, it's just a bit more tricky in Power Apps. And I don't mean to badmouth Power Apps on some of these slides. I am very, very fond of it. I just think that it, there's a place for each of these. And when we're talking about, when I say about there, the, the lifecycle management, Power Apps can be a bit more time consuming. When we update things, we either have to maybe update that same bit in the app on the different environments, um, or we have to extract the app itself and then import it in each environment as a new version. It's just that bit more time consuming than having the ability to get your code deployed and just updating a certain bit and gets a lot faster when you start to talk about SPFX and you have that continuous integration, continuous deployment possible, perhaps with some limitations on that side, but it makes it much easier to manage things across your different environment when you have those practices in place. Having your own local one, pushing it through, having approvals at each stage of the game so that you know that what you're doing is clean, it's reviewed and you've got your own peace of mind, as well as the peace of mind of the people that are managing this process. And it moves us on to where I did hit my frustrations last year, which is the parts that made me decide to rant at you for 30 minutes in my discussion with um, Aaron. And um, where you start to hit some of the licenses and limitations with the choices you make, you might make the, the right choice um, of product for the needs that you have, but the needs that then follow from there might make you perhaps hit some limitations as you go. And it can be a, a complete minefield. I, mean, I was, I was mid-project when we discovered the licensing changes that Power Apps had and um, then had the lovely discussion of um, how much more that's going to cost now that we need, need to license everything that's happening based on what we're doing. But it's, it's starting with a scenario that is based on a true story. Um, that happened to me, um, and a, a discussion I had with a customer, something that was needed. And it takes us through where it can go. And so, basic terms, we need a form. It's a really simple form. We need it quick. We need it simple. Uh, let's use MS Forms. Alex, don't make this complicated. Let's use MS Forms. Okay, no worries. I mean, you could build it yourself if you want. It's fine. But let's just double check. I mean, how many people are going to use this? Uh, probably about 90% of the firm. Well, bear in mind, that's 9,000 people. In my real life story, it was actually a bit more than that. Um, so it's 9,000 people that you're going to have filling out this form. So is, it, is this a one-off? No, no, no. Two times a week. So go for it. Come on, make it quick. We want it to, We need this today. I thought, well, hang on a minute. You've got to, you've got to think about this. Um, if this is a form that's going out to that many people a couple of times a week, let's bear in mind, I'm guessing this is business critical. I'm guessing we're going to need some pretty um, user-friendly elements to this. It's got to be nice. It's got to be sleek. But you've got to think about those limits. 9,000 people, that's 18,000 records a week. 
you've got to think about when your limits are going to be hit. And when, when I was looking into the limits, I found differing articles. I found one that scared the life out of me that said that you had um, a 1,000 response limit or 2,000 with Forms Pro. But then I did find a Microsoft article that said it was 50,000, which is a lot better, but we're still going to hit that limit. And you've got to take into account that you have those cosmetics that people appreciate and you don't, and you don't want to underestimate their importance. No same as draft, limitation in terms of validation and design. And getting to that backend data as well is not as easy with Microsoft Forms and getting in, out and reporting on it is it's not quite as easy. So um, maybe, maybe well, could we use a Power App then, Alex? So we can save the data to a SharePoint list. And my anxiety starts going up about having thousands of rows in a SharePoint list. I think I don't believe in SharePoint, it's fine. Um, but we also, um, now that if it's going to go there, that's great because we need to start running flows against these as well. We need some automated processes. Um, so we need weekly reports, we need notifications, we need actions, we need all these things to are done. And it will still be web page. So perfect. Well, um, we can have the problematic management of lists that size. Um, you've got to be careful, Man, like plan your indexing, plan your views, plan this. Um, if we did it as a power app, uh, how, how can, you, can you be sure you're not going to be sucking in too much data to the app itself to be able to use in like an admin interface? Um, you're going to hit some limits there. So be careful. But also with these flows that you're running on the large data sets, you, you've got to be careful with those two for a few different reasons if you're starting to do that. Well, OK. Can we use a database? You can use a database, but if you're going to connect a power app to it, then you're hitting another block. Because if you want to connect a power app to a database, a lot of the time, the common things you're going to do, it'll need a premium license per app, £7.50 per month for every person that uses it. Or you can go per user, meaning they can use as many of these as they want for £30 a month. Now, in a small company, that might not be a big deal. In a large company, the likes of which I was dealing with, that's pretty horrendous. And so we're thinking, no, we, we, we don't want to do that. And although we, one of the apps where I had this problem, we did end, end up going down the per app route. And despite the fact that even this company's licensed resellers couldn't explain to me how per app licenses worked or how they get applied when I first needed to learn about this, um, I was pleasantly surprised at how easy it was about how with a per app licensing model, it did just automatically assign the licenses to the app every time we added people in. And it was a lot easier than I thought. It was just soured by the taste of the cost associated with it. And also we had problems with flows on large data sets that we'd seen before that really did ring alarm bells with us because we had systems in the past where it was only a few thousand records, but we needed to have weekly emails sent. So it would scan through all the items, it would bring back reports based on location, it would format them in a lovely HTML view in an email and send it out. And it was great, it looked brilliant. But we hit all kinds of issues as a result of doing that on larger scale ones. We hit some problems when it came to um, this little doozy here, um, this table that came out where we realized um, sort of just in time that we were having some problems because we had all of our flows running using a service account. And so it was a single account running with these flows. And in certain cases, carrying out thousands of actions at a time because it was running it over so many items. And that then rang alarm. I was thinking, okay, well, these, these limits, these API requests, um, an API request, if I'm correct from what I looked into at the time, being pretty much anything that thing does, any, any trigger, any step, any action. And we went into um, their Office 365 admin where you can then look in the, right, the relevant sections to see the API usage. And, it was just off the chart and I thought, oh, crikey. And when we were looking at this, we thought, well, do you know what? This is perhaps a good opportunity for us to push this change that we've been wanting to do because even though it was only running over a few thousand items to do these actions, it was still taking hours to run. It was doing it, it was taking hours. We had one flow that started turning itself off. It was just, oh, knack it off. And we had to turn it back on again. And that same flow, which we then converted over to an Azure function, ran exactly the same thing, but it did it in seconds. And so there was that light bulb moment when we thought, OK, flow, everything about it and in there is great. And we're going to keep using it because it's brilliant for all these functions and these different ways of doing things when stuff is submitted. But on these larger scale things, maybe it's not the right choice for us. Maybe we do need to start looking at Azure functions because we're talking about different databases, different data sources. 
And then with Flow, again, you, need, you get into the realms of needing a premium license to connect to these things or connect with custom APIs that we were doing. Azure Functions takes that away and means you need more expertise to do it, but it's quicker and it's more efficient as a result of it when it came out. And so closing out, I, I think I'm hopefully not too far behind. I didn't see what time I started, but this is just my opinion. And as I said at the start, all of this is really, a lot of it is my opinion. It's based on the opinions of my colleagues and it's based on the opinions I've read online. But the way I see it is power apps are a good choice when perhaps you're not working with large amounts of data. Um, they're not the speediest to open. You do notice a speed difference when you're opening a power app compared to any other comparative solution. And the larger data that goes into it, you see those little ants run across the screen at the top and it just takes a while. So, and then you hit limitations. If you're not going to make it too complicated, not going to make it too complex um, to get yourself into trouble. If it's a, a lesser complex and it's just a bit more simple, go for it. And if you need it quick, obviously. Maybe if you don't need true responsiveness in that one app, um, there may be somebody that could beg to differ about how good responsive is in Power Apps. Um, just personally, I, I prefer SPFX from that side. And also, it's just a bit easier if you focus on internal with these. If you have a, a small amount of designated external parties that are licensed, great, but larger scale, perhaps not. And unless you want to pay the licensing for it, if you're not connecting to custom sources. SPFX, it's better with larger amounts of data, with more complex logic requirements, if responsiveness is, is important. So we have one form that just looks nice, no matter what I use it on. And also, if you want better management practices of the way you build your solutions and the way you manage your code. If you want faster loading times, because it is so much faster, um, but you want rapid, rapid development, but integration to databases at no additional cost. And also you need perhaps easier sharing to name external users, ones that maybe don't have licenses. And the custom, this is when you need the uh, the, uh, the PS de la Resistance, perhaps. You need that truly custom solution built exactly to your needs without compromise. Compromise that you might find in a power app based on the expressions and the functions that are available to you in there. Something that is truly enterprise scale and is the, the, big, the big boy of everything, or big person perhaps, wherever you want to put it. But if you have the comp complex backend logic and automation and processing requirements, so something that you can really build to meet the most complicated of needs and do it, do it with style and do it with power. The easy external access, whether authenticated or public, freedom to integrate with other systems and not be constrained by perhaps licenses. And also, if you're really talking about those significant amounts of data, um, uh, the solution I mentioned before, which was anticipated to be a million within a year, but that's still small scale compared to a lot of other companies and the kind of data that they're dealing with. And so with that, thank you for paying attention to me having a little rant as I go through. And um, like I said at the start, that it's, it's a real shame that this is something that can't be done in person because I really would like, would have liked for this to have been more a conversation starter than just a presentation. Uh, something that could have maybe provoked a conversation or two over a couple of beers another time afterwards, but uh, perhaps that will happen at another date. So in the meantime, I will just say thank you very much. I think the time for um, meeting in person uh, will come soon enough, hopefully. And uh, the old licensing debate, uh, there's quite a lot <laughs> happening in the chat. Alex, your, uh, your sessions generated the most most amount of comments um and it's the you know it's the the normal story around the whole power platform licensing debate and you know al is is quite rightly to say it's, it's it's not just the cost you know you have to sort of take a step back and and what is that to the organization because obviously if you are yeah. using you know those different data repositories you are getting the benefits as well and the security and the compliance um, absolutely. Yeah, uh, absolutely right. There's always yeah the, the different perspectives. I mean, one one way we've had is um, we ended up going down the custom solution to spare the cost of the licensing in Power Apps because the, the licensing cost actually exceeded the amount it would have cost to pay us to build the custom version for them. So it was actually still that cost saving, but that that's a that scenario that doesn't always exist. 
Yeah, I, I know the guys from work on the call. You know, we had many discussions, conversations around the whole, you know, should we do this in Power App? Should we do this in a web app? Should we do this in Power Automate? Should we do this in Logic App? Should we do it in Azure Functions? And a lot of the time it does come down to cost because ultimately the, the customer is, is going to be ending up paying for it. And, it, you know, there's, there's multiple ways to deliver solutions in the Microsoft stack. And, you know, that for me, coming from a SharePoint background has been, you know, applicable um, in the SharePoint world, document management world, content management world. You know, there's always two or three different ways to, to be able to deliver a solution. And I think, in fact, now we've got Power Apps and we've got Azure Web Apps, and we've got Logic Apps and <laughs> Power Automate and Functions and, and Web Hooks and everything else, you know, yeah. APIs, API management. You know, there's always more than one way to deliver a solution. So I think it's, it's, it's always down to finding the right solution for the requirement and weighing up the options around costs security and compliance and and every requirement is always different i don't think there can be a you know written in stone as such way of of, of being able to achieve a a certain requirement because yeah there's always a couple of ways isn't there absolutely but no, that's been uh, really good and um i think we've had a really good variety of, of sessions this evening you know starting off with al and Moving on to Josh, um, you know, I've had a few text messages as well, just saying, you know, the whole Power Automate error handling, you know, should really just be basic coding standards, really. Um, and then just finishing off that has been brilliant. So um, um, I just want to say, you know, time's ticking on, obviously. Um, but thank you all for, for joining. Um, been a really good evening, really insightful. Um, I picked up on a few, bit, few bits, so um, yeah, very, very, happy thank you very much and um yeah thank you josh al alex for um yeah taking taking the evening out of your diary or um for speaking for us thank you for having me no problem yeah, thank you thanks everyone thanks here cheers guys all right well, well um we're if, unless there's any questions we'll um we'll close up um, but yeah, thank you very much for, uh, for all joining and hopefully we'll see you at the next user group. Excellent. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Back to work for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's midday for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I might go and uh, grab another beer and uh, put my feet up on the sofa and, and just chill for an hour and then, then hit the sack. Oh, yeah. <laughs> are, you, are you busy at work? At work, Josh. Oh yeah, we're so busy. <laughs> <laughs> lots going on. Um, Is it just lots of Azure stuff, or you you touch uh, on? So actually, I'm building a Power App right now, just because they the team that does the Power Apps and stuff, they're kind of really, really, really busy because they do Power BI as well. So they got me to do the Power App, but it's been pretty. It's it's not a it's not a small Power App. It's it's massive and. For some reason, every time we meet with the stakeholders, the app keeps getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> for some reason, and then and then integration, the integration stuff is also very very um, busy right now. We've been moving everything to the cloud. So. Do you, do you see? Um, I'm I'm sort of seeing you know the likes of Power BI sort of being in a data world rather than a power platform world. You know, there's there's lots of people, lots of activity going on in Power Apps and Power Automate, and probably quite a lot around, you know, Azure functions, uh, mm. API management, and probably a bit of SQL as well. But actually what I see is, you know, the, the data piece, the Power BI bit is sort of separated. It's rare that we do you know, a power platform engagement that includes Power Apps and Power BI. It's normally data modernization projects in, in one team and they're doing a bit of Power BI, they're doing a bit of Azure Synapse, there's Azure SQL and Data Factory and, and all that, all the other stuff that goes with that. And then you've got, 
you know, Power App, Power Automate, Logic App sort of sit in another camp. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so it's funny actually with the first app I built uh, like a long time ago for uh, Interpipeline, they, um, we actually, it was because it was fairly new to them to integrate them all. And we actually, we built, I built a Power App that had like 10 flows attached to it. And then also there was Power BI integrated into the app. And it was actually showcased at Ignite in 2019, I think. I think my manager, uh, Kent Weir at the time, he um, he showcased it at uh, Ignite as a better together type of thing. Yeah, it's pretty cool. But yeah, I, I see what I see what you mean with the Power BI. Even it's even funny, even with MVPs and uh, um, <laughs> you, 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 like you think Biz Apps MVP would have Power BI into it in it, but it's actually not. It's actually a different category, which is funny. It's in the it's in the data category. So yeah, that's what I mean. I, I just think it's it's the whole dynamics conversation as well. You know, even the the latest exams, PL two hundred, four hundred. You know, there's so much dynamics referenced in it, including the yeah. words dynamics and <laughs> sales and marketing and it's like this is a power platform. You know, people are coming either from a SharePoint world or from a dynamics world or you know, a an info path or an access world, and they just use power apps, you know, canvas apps um, or model driven apps potentially, although I think what I see is 90% of it being canvas driven mm -hmm. with a bit of power automate and a bit of logic apps. They don't they have no idea or understanding of dynamics. And I know on you know under the hood, you know, the foundations, the building mm -hmm. bricks very similar and it's built on the same infrastructure, but you know, building a canvas app is completely different to building a model driven app. Oh yeah. Yeah. And and you sure. see it, it, you know, on Twitter, you know, you look at people who's passed or failed and the exam revision guides. It's you know, there's dynamics references in a power platform. And you know, power platform is power apps, power automate, <laughs> power BI and power virtual agents. There's no dynamics. <laughs> so It'll be nice yeah. at some point, you know, for Microsoft to recognize Power BI is data, Dynamics is Dynamics, and Power Apps, Power Automate is 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 Power Apps and Power Automate. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, just as much as SharePoint, SharePoint, and <laughs> security and compliance and entitlements is is in that remit. But but yeah. Yeah, I totally see where you're coming from. But yeah, cool. All right, mate. Well, thank you very much. Um, yeah. I think there's a few of us left on the call, but um, I, yeah. was, I was being nosy. It was a topic of interest, so I thought I'd hang on. <laughs> yeah, it's just I, I have the argument internally all the time around. Well, it's not an argument. It's you know how we debate. It's let's not do it in logic apps. Let's do it in Azure Functions because we know we could do it in a function, and it's not going to cost a tenth yeah. what it would cost in a logic app. So, and um, yeah. you know, <laughs> and it's a way around the whole premium connector piece as well isn't it if you are doing something in a in an rpa world that's talking to a https or sql database you know you, you wouldn't do it in in automate because you've got all the restrictions but if you do it in a as your function it runs 10 times quicker and it's got minimal licensing costs yeah, it's kind of funny. It's, it's just Microsoft saying, oh, great, you're going to save loads of money because you don't need developers. You're going to have people in your business build these things, but oh, it's going to cost you a fortune. <laughs> it's those extra bits that jump in. Yeah, <laughs> the thing is, though, so Chris Huntingford makes a good point, though. So, you know, a, a power platform license, a premium license, you know, if you've got up to eight apps, it costs what seven pounds twenty a month, which you know is just two cups of coffee. Yeah. You, you take into account, you know, they're probably paying fifty pound a person license, and and if they were to go to a Dynamics world or a Salesforce world, they'd be paying sixty seventy quid a month per per user. And then you've got people that have got Tableau and they're paying for a license, but actually, if they had a Power App Premium. And a Power BI premium, you know, they're only paying 14 odd pound more a month. So the cost for a couple of cup of coffees that you know they're probably quite happy to go buy anyway. 
it's it's minimal, isn't it? Really. But yeah. What I don't understand is, you know, you could go and provision an Azure SQL database with 250 gigabytes of data for nine pound fifty six a month. But if you want to create a one gigabyte CDS or Dataverse, it's twenty five pound a gigabyte. <laughs> wow. So, you know, if you've got a 10 or 100 gig database that you want to use with a model driven app or a canvas app, you know, that's a lot of money for a bit of storage. And yeah, OK, you get the views and you get the security, but a lot of that you can do in SQL anyway. It's just a bit more development. But the cost of developer doing what you can do versus a 25 pound. <laughs> A gigabyte of data is just, mm. just a bit crazy. Uh, hey ho, it keeps us in a job. It does. <laughs> right, I'm going to leave you guys to it. I'm going to um, yeah. call it a night and, and check on the kids. Um, yep. so yeah, thank you. For, I'm going to uh, tuck into the wine. So thank you very much for having me along. <laughs> <laughs> have you have you opened it now? Um, I wasn't sure if you would have heard the sound of a cork popping the moment I finished my slides, um, but uh, yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> nice, excellent. All right, mate. All right, cool. have a good one, everyone. Yeah, cheers, cheers. thank you, Josh. Yeah, catch you yeah. later. Bye. Cheers, all.